Good morning, everyone. So good to be back together again after uh, a week from the weather. Something so nice about gathering together to worship the Lord. Let me encourage us today out of Psalm 61. Psalm 61 of David. Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the end of the earth I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have become my refuge, a strong tower against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge under the shelter of your wings, Selah. For you, O oh God, have heard my vows. You have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. Prolong the life of the king. May his years endure to all generations. May he be enthroned forever before God. Appoint steadfast love and faithfulness to watch over him. So will I ever sing praises to your name as I perform my vows day after day. The Lord hears as we cry. We can go to him. He has shown himself worthy. He has shown himself to be our refuge and our strength. Let's stand together and consider our great God, the greatness of our God. Yeah. 
great you truly are. Father, what wonderful hope that we have that as your word says, one day every knee will bow, every tongue confess that you are God. They shall see your greatness, see you high and lifted up, seated on your throne as you are. Father, we know this from your word, yet we Father, we are oftentimes troubled, scared, in a panic, worked up, angry about the things that we see in this world, and out of a place that forgets so easily that you are seated on that throne, and Lord, that you will one day make all things right. Father, as David wrote, Listen to my prayer from the end of the earth. I call to you when my heart is faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I, for you have been my refuge. Father, your word is filled with truths like this, that you are our refuge, that we can be called up to a safe place, to a higher place. Yet, Lord, we confess there were often times where we do not cry out for that. We do not seek you as refuge. Father, we seek comfort in so many things in this earth. We seek comfort in our favorite foods. We seek comfort in binge watching our favorite show again and again. Lord, we seek comfort in listening to different songs, even songs that don't honor you. Lord, we seek comfort in refuge in gossiping with others. Lord, we'll seek comfort and refuge with being angry and going on rants and rages. Lord, forgive us for these things. Lord, let our heart's desire truly to be to let us dwell in your tent forever. That we would truly take refuge under the shelter of your wings. God, that we would know that you have heard our vows before you. God, that our desire would be that you as king would reign forever and ever. Not just that we know that that would be true, but that we would long for it to be true. Lord, we confess all these things to you this morning. And Lord, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, give us clean hearts that we would be able to ever sing praises to your name. Lord, that we would perform our vows to you day after day that we would live, Lord, to live in a way that is pleasing to you. Help us, Lord. Remind us of the gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's continue singing, continue uh, thinking of the Lord, what he has done. What a great mystery it is This, as we see the story played out. As we're going through Exodus now and seeing how God has worked his mercy and forgiven sinners such as us. Come behold the wondrous mystery in the dawning of the King. He the theme of heaven's praises robed in frail humanity. In our longing, in our darkness, now the light of life has come. Look to Christ who condescended, took on flesh to
Christmas tree, Christ the Lord upon the tree. In the stead of ruined sinners hangs the Lamb in victory. See the price of our redemption. See the Father's plan unfold, bringing many sons to glory with some measure not remain standing together. We're actually going to start a, a new verse, a uh, new couple of verses this week um, as we're going through um, Exodus. But let's together in unity and uh, of one mind, one heart, let's say this together, proclaim these words. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Amen. Let's take a seat. Well, good morning, church family. It's so good to see those of you who are here. Obviously, we have uh, many who are battling sickness or uh, just couldn't come due to uh, the weather conditions. I know some are still trying to get out of their own driveways and all, so uh, I know it's a, a challenge uh, for many, but uh, so good to see you here. I'm sure probably by the looks of our congregation here, there's probably more of you watching than normal, and so if you are watching on, uh, on video, we, uh, we're just so glad you could be with us, know that we miss you, and look forward to when you can uh, be back with us here in person. But uh, uh, this morning, we will continue our journey through uh, the book of Exodus, and uh, we'll be in Exodus chapter 3 here in just a few moments. Uh, but let me ask you this question. If you could change one thing about yourself, what would it be? One thing. Now, I, I know that uh, ladies, you know, I hear ladies all the time, you know, they're talking about, well, you know, if they've got curly hair, oh, I wish my hair was straight, or if I had straight hair, oh, I wish it was curly, you know, or maybe you wish it was a different color or what have you. Some of us just wish we had more hair, but hey, we won't talk about that. Uh, others of you, maybe it's an issue of, you know, hey, I wish I was taller than I was, or maybe I wish I was a little bit shorter, you know, I think of Bobby Beecher, you know, 6'10". You know, the world is not made for guys like that, you know? I mean, you, the cars are not made for guys like that. Airplanes are not made for guys like that. Doors, you know, having to duck, get through the door. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are some days where Bobby probably wishes, you know, that uh, I was a little bit shorter than what I was. But, uh, and there are other days I wish, you know, my wife was taller than she was, but, so I wouldn't have to be the one reaching up in the cabinet, you know. But, hey, that's neither here nor there. But uh, it might be that you wish that you were smarter than you were. Right? I don't know if too many people wish they were dumber, but uh, you know, uh, we, maybe we all wish we were a little bit smarter. Uh, some of you might wish you had a better back than what you, I don't know who that would be, but 
uh, wish he had a better back. It was tough for me. Hey, just, just so you know, it was hard for me uh, when the snow came to not be able to shovel the snow. It, it grieved me deeply to see my family out there shoveling. And uh, I tried not to be too judgmental and, you know, tell them, hey, you missed a spot, you know, but hey, you know, it, it is what it is. But, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that we might wish that we could change uh, about ourselves. But here's, here's the, the beauty of what we'll see even in uh, Exodus chapter 3 is how God will use imperfect vessels to do incredible work, uh, God, godly work in and through uh, people who are fallible, who are fallen, who are imperfect in so many ways. And so we are going to uh, rejoice, hopefully, as we see God working through the man Moses, uh, even though, obviously, he is a man that has been esteemed throughout uh, the millennia here. Uh, Just uh, He is the figure, one of the main figures. He is on the Mount Rushmore, if you will, of, of not only the uh, Israelite, the Jewish faith, but but for Christians as well. But yet, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, he's a murderer. Who gets on Mount Rushmore being a murderer, right? And so what a reminder to us of the grace of God, how he takes imperfect vessels, however flawed we are, but yet he just desires hearts that are humble, that are teachable, that are moldable, and are ready to submit to his will. And so we're going to see that played out in Moses' life here in just a few moments. But uh, as, we, uh, as we continue, obviously, uh, as I said, I'm sure there's a lot of sickness going on. do want to ask specifically that you be praying for uh, a sister, uh, uh, Sandy Lacey, who is in the hospital battling COVID pneumonia and uh, just really uh, struggling there. And we just want to lift her up. Uh, during this time. And I know there are others. Uh, I know many of you had sickness of various kinds, and uh, praise God, you're back. Uh, But I know others of you are still battling and struggling at home. So uh, we want to be praying for one another during this time. Uh, Don't forget, in the busyness of everything that's going on in life, uh, to, to pause, to just take time. We were talking about that in our Connect group this morning, just how quick we are to forget and to get into life and to live life. And we want to make sure that we are taking time to to connect with God, but to pray for one another. And so that's what I want to do for you this morning uh, is take time to pray over you. And let me do that right now. So God, as we gather before you right now, thank you for, uh, God, just this, um, this privilege of of being together physically. Thank you for the privilege of even crutch to where we uh, become lazy, apathetic, and think, well, I think I'll just stay at home today and I can just watch it online. God, we want that online presence to be there for those who genuinely cannot be here, whether it's sickness, uh, just other, other needs that, that can't be helped. But Lord, may it never be a crutch that we, we lean upon and come to and that would keep us away from one another. So God, it is as we gather, we are reminded of just how glorious it is to see your, your Holy Spirit at work in and amongst us as we interact with each other, as we see each other in person, eyeball to eyeball, as we talk, as we share uh, just victories together as we share struggles together. God, it makes us uh, more the body of Christ uh, when we are able to just share life together and to know what's going on and to encourage each other. But Lord, as we are, even as we're dispersed, we, may we not forget that we are, we are still the body of Christ, that wherever we go, we are to be there for one another, encouraging building each other up, strengthening each other. And so, God, as we get ready to uh, look at Exodus 3 here this morning, and God, there is is so much for us to glean and learn and grow from. I pray, God, that as we uh, encounter you in this passage, may it cause us, God, to worship you at a deeper level. God, may it bring conviction 
about how we have, have that tendency to forget just how holy you are. May it remind us of, of who we are. As, as Moses is he's even going to ask that question, who am I? And he is going to ask the question, who are you? God, even though in those two questions there, those are kind of foundational questions that should lead us into deeper worship of you. And so, God, I pray that even though there is much that we would desire to change about ourselves, maybe it's physically and other ways, God, may our heart's desire be, oh God, I want to change from within. I want to become more like Christ. God, may that be our true motive and our greatest desire this morning and moving forward. And so, Lord, thank you for this gathering that we can come and, and be reminded that we, we tend to, to fade and, and stray. And God, this morning it is a time for us to uh, kind of come back to center and to reboot and be reminded once again of what life is really about. And it is as much as, yes, it is about us and how we're living our lives. God, it is more about you and making much of you. God, I pray that uh, in every area of our worship this morning, it's our singing, our listening, even in our giving. God, we, we pray that in every aspect that, God, it would be pleasing to you, that it would just be a, a, a season of just gladness, of rejoicing in you. And so, uh, God, as we continue on, we pray that you would just continue to dig deeply within our hearts and minds, conforming us and shaping us into the image of your Son. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Before Brett comes and preaches, continue with Rex. Why don't we stand together? Just consider the holiness of God. Considering this holy moment that we're about to go into uh, with Moses approaching this burning bush. And what an incredible sight and experience that, that is at that moment. So let's consider God's holiness and all that he is, all that he's accomplished. Worship the 
Take a seat and hear from God's word this morning. Chip, you all are dismissed. Sorry, helped to turn that on. The rest of you, I'll uh, ask you to open up your Bibles to uh, Exodus chapter 3 as we uh, continue on here in our series. Um, Just to uh, give you a little refresher now. Uh, in case you weren't here for uh, the first two chapters, and, uh, and in case you're like me, you just have a tendency to forget, and uh, we'll go back over uh, just the highlights of chapters one and two. Uh, and so as we enter into Exodus, if you'll remember, uh, Exodus is uh, almost a, a continuation of, of Genesis, uh, but there was about a, a 400-year gap between the time when Genesis ends, remember uh, Joseph uh, is, uh, is now second in command of all of Egypt. And he uh, is used by God not only to save physically Egyptians and even the people of Israel, 
because of the famine that was going on. But, uh, but God leads the people of Israel out of what we know as the promised land, even though uh, they weren't really understanding at, at the time, but leading them out, bringing them to Egypt. And so here we see that, uh, that they grow from uh, 70 people of the family of, of Jacob. Uh, now they are approximately 2 million people that have grown here in the land of Egypt over those 400 years. And so uh, there is a new Pharaoh that, that rises up, and he, it says that he does not know who Joseph is, right? He forgets, doesn't really know Joseph, didn't know him personally. And because of this, he now is in control, and he is looking at the Israelites, and he is seeing a, a nation of people that has just grown immensely. And so he, being in command, feared the Israelites. He feared that they would grow so uh, numerous and so powerful that they would overthrow Egypt. So Pharaoh had to think to himself, man, what am I going to do about this problem? And so he uh, does uh, a couple of things. One, he enslaves them. He, he puts them in slavery, uh, just cruel, brutal, uh, harsh slavery, and uh, they are just dominate, dominating them. He believes that, hey, if I can just work them so hard, then they'll just be too hard to reproduce. They'll just fail to, to continue to grow. But we see in God's word that uh, that backfired on him. That uh, even the harder that the labor was, the more that the people of Israel grew. And so he had to take matters into his own hands again. He's like, hey, slavery's not working. Uh, I'm going to have them kill the, uh, the children, uh, all the males, and try to uh, prevent their growth in that, in that manner. And so uh, he, he tries to do that. We see that the midwives, that they uh, don't, uh, don't cooperate. You know, he's having them throw uh, the, the boys into the, into the Nile River and to, and to kill them. But, but yet, despite all of that, God is still protecting the people of Israel. And God is still uh, continuing to, to bless them. And within that, we saw where there was this one mother with a son who loved her son and tried to do everything she could to protect him. And so she put him in a basket in the Nile, sent him down the river, and it was Pharaoh's daughter who discovered who we know as Moses there in the basket. And, she, and so she protected him. She adopted him basically into her family, and, uh, and Moses grew up into Pharaoh's uh, family. He grew up in royalty, if you will. Uh, there in Egypt. And so we see that Moses would grow up and at some point in time he would discover that he was not Egyptian but he was an Israelite. He was Jewish. And so uh, Moses watched day in and day out the treatment of the Jewish people as he sees the abuse carrying on. And he starts uh, feeling the pain that they're, that they're feeling. Now obviously not physically but within his spirit and within his heart, he was connected with them. And we know that one day Moses went out, he saw the mistreatment of uh, a, uh, one of the Israelites by an Egyptian. He looks around, see if anybody's looking, kills the Egyptian. Moses is a murderer. And so Moses thinks he's got, gotten away with it, but then come to find out, the next day he goes out and he realizes, uh-oh, word is out. I've killed an Egyptian. Obviously, word got back to Pharaoh. Pharaoh has it out. He has a, a death warrant out for, for Moses, if you will. Moses flees to the land of Midian. And it is there that he comes into contact with uh, w what would be eventually his wife. And so, uh, so Moses is there, and uh, his father-in-law is a priest there in Midian. But he's also a shepherd, and so Moses becomes a shepherd as well, and he is tending the flocks of his uh, father-in-law. And it is there that God remembers the covenant that he made with the Israelites. And so he is going to be using uh, a savior of sorts in the person of Moses to free his people from bondage to the Egyptians. And so we, we're seeing here, uh, as we saw a couple weeks ago, that God 
cares for his people. Now, I know you're sitting there thinking, man, how could God care for his people when he's allowed them to go through, you know, I mean, just decades and decades and centuries of, of slavery, brutal slavery, and to, and to go through everything that they did. But God has a purpose. He has a plan. And so we, we trust him in that. And he shows his care for them and that he is going to bring a deliverer to them in order to bring them out. And so uh, the first two chapters, uh, like I said, they covered uh, really 400 years of, of slavery, of pain, and of tribulation. The, the remaining 38 chapters that we will see through the book of Exodus will cover the years, uh, really the year of liberation, the year of, of freedom of the Egyptians coming out of Egypt, all the events that take place in that, and the establishment of the law of God and how he is going to direct them in their worship. And so that gives us a, a quick background of, of the first two chapters there. And so we want to pick it up here in chapter 3 of Exodus. And uh, let me read for you beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, which is really Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was not burning, yet it was not consumed. Or it was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to Moses out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Now, let me just, let me just kind of summarize, summarize those, those verses there. We see in these verses, first of all, we're introduced again to a man named Jethro. Now, earlier, in the earlier chap chapters, it, it referenced him as uh, Reuel, okay? It, but it's the same, same person. It is Moses' father-in-law here. And so Jethro means his excellency. Now, a lot of people would, uh, a lot of commentators would say that is more of a, a title than it is a, a name. Uh, we don't know, but uh, he is referred to Jethro basically from this point forward. And so uh, we see here that Moses is led uh, really by the hand of God to Horeb that we know as Mount Sinai here. Uh, and so it is uh, God bringing him here, why? To reveal himself to Moses. He, he refers to it there uh, in that uh, uh, first verse there as the mountain of God. The mountain of God because he introduces himself here, but it would later be the place that he would really introduce more intimately himself to the people of God, the people of Israel uh, with the laws, the Ten Commandments, and so on. So uh, he goes on, and, and he describes that the angel of the Lord appeared. He appeared in a, in a flame, uh, a fire out of the midst of the bush. Notice here that this angel of the Lord is speaking as God, not just for God, right? What do we take from that? Well, we take from that that this is what is uh, known as a theophany. This is a, a pre-incarnate uh, appearance, if you will, uh, of, of God, of, of Christ here in this, uh, in this text. He was, he was, Moses was in the very presence of God himself. And so we see that this bush is burning, but yet what? It's not being consumed. And so fire, as we know, fire is, is this fantastic representation of God in Scripture, is it not? I mean, uh, it's beautifully representative here of, the, of God's holiness. Because what do we, what do we know about, about fire? Well, we know that we are drawn to fire, right? I mean, it seems like whenever there's a fire, there's something about it that, that kind of captivates us that draws our attention to us, uh, you know, and, and that we are wanting to go see uh, uh, what, it, what it is a little bit more up close. And so we're drawn to it. There is this curiosity. There is this 
amazement, if you will, uh, about fire. It is a purifying force, fire is. But, it, but we also tell children, on the other hand, don't play with fire. All right, Avoid it. Stay away from it. And so we, we see here that, that fire is to be taken seriously. Fire is to be feared. It is to be respected just like God is. And so we see all of that being played out here as, as Moses approaches this burning bush. I, lo- I love what R.C. Sproul says. He says, we tend to have mixed feelings about the holy, the fire. There is a sense in which we are at the same time attracted to it and repulsed by it. Something draws us toward it, while at the same time, we want to run away from it. We can't seem to decide which way we want it. Part of us yearns for the holy, while part of us despises it. We can't live with it, and we can't live without it. What a description of the holiness of God. The fact is, and the fact is that what was, what was not being consumed demonstrates that, that God has this never-ending power. So as this bush is burning, this fire is, is there representing the holiness of God, but yet it is showing as well just how he is all-powerful and his power never, never ends. God is completely uh, self-existent. He is also self-sustaining and self-sufficient in himself. And so God calls Moses by name, showing both an intimacy there, that he would know Moses, but it's also showing uh, that, that God is, is all-knowing himself. And he, he knows everything about you and I just as much as he knew about Moses himself. And so he calls Moses by name, and we're reminded uh, of Psalm 139 when the psalmist wrote, he said, my frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. This is what God knew of Moses. That's what he knows of us. That's why we celebrate the sanctity of human life uh, this month as, as Southern Baptists. That's why there was a March for Life uh, in D.C. Uh, those who understand that life is precious. Life is something that God gives. Regardless of the circumstances of how conception came, every life is important to God. No life is an accident. Every life has a purpose, has meaning, and we are to protect it. And so God, he didn't have to call Moses, and he doesn't have to call any of us, right? But yet, in his mercy, he did that very thing. And that's what it was. It was mercy he was extending not only to Moses... He was extending mercy to the people of Israel, and he extends mercy to every one of us. He desires what? To be known and to be worshipped. That is the God of Scripture. He desires for us to know him, and he desires for us to worship him. And so he says that, Moses, take off your sandals. Why? Because you're on holy ground. It's the first time in the Bible that, the, that Scripture references and uses the word holy in description of, of God. Holy means to be separate. It means to be, uh, tra- God is transcendent. He is otherworldly. All right? He is unlike us in any way. It is to be set apart. And so God's command to not come closer only stresses the great gap that stands between us and God. We live in a world where most people talk about God as if he's, he's their, their best friend. He's a buddy, right? He, they, they kind of bring God down to their own level, thinking that God, uh, God's some cool dude, you know, and, and he, you know, they, they try to make him into this, this buddy where, hey, we can have fun together, and the things that I do wrong, he just kind of winks at and says, okay, just try not to do that again. That's the God that has been created within culture. But yet God is showing us here, oh, he is so much more than that. He is a God that is stressing the great gap between ourselves and himself. And so the only way for us to come into the presence of of a holy God is for us to be holy ourselves. Now, I don't know about you, 
that's already stressing a huge problem, right? That there is a, a, a huge gap between his holiness and our holiness because we are the furthest thing from being holy. And so we have a, an incredible problem here as we think about that. But, but Hebrews ch- chapter 10, verses 21 and 22 says this. It says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. And so we see that it is this holy God who will eventually bring a holy cure to that dilemma that we face. And then he says so beautifully there in, chapter, in verse 6, he says, after he, after he says, hey, take your sandals off, your own holy ground, and then God tells him who he is. He says, I am the God of, of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so we see here that God didn't say, I was the God of Abraham. I was the God of Isaac. I was the God of Jacob. He didn't say that, did he? He said, I am that God. Probably this truth was was taught by by Jethro to Moses, and, and he was probably uh, reminded once again of the history, even though he grow, grew up in Pharaoh's royal household. It was here, probably in these years, that, that Moses was revealed, it was revealed to Moses by probably his father in law Jethro the, the history of his family. He probably told him all about Abraham, told him all about Isaac, told him all about Jacob, but more importantly, he told him about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But how beautiful it is that in saying that, he says that I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is stressing that they are still alive. Did you get that? I am. I am still the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I have not left them, and they have not left me. They are still alive today, and I am. I'm still their God, and I am taking care of them forevermore. And what great hope that that brings for us. Man, I think of our own church family and the losses that we have, we have experienced, uh, you know, over years and, and uh, even recently. I mean, I, I think of Claire May and God saying, I am the God of Claire May. I, I am the, the God of, of, of Ron Nicely. I am the God of of Elsie Trail. I am the God of Brian Godswa. I am the God. You fill in the blank of your loved one. I am the God of those who have repented and put their faith and trust in me. I am their God. They are alive more today than they were even when they were here. They are with Christ. And so Jesus used this very verse. All right, think about this. Jesus used this very verse here to prove the resurrection to the Sadducees. All right, look at look at Matthew chapter 22. Jesus said, and as for the resurrection of the dead, he's talking to the Sadducees here. Have you not read what was said to you by God? What was said? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. That right there, Jesus himself was giving commentary to what we are reading here in Exodus chapter 3. He is telling the Sadducees and he is telling everyone who is listening, his disciples and everyone who's around him, God is not the God of the dead. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're not gods of the past. They're men of the present. They are still alive. Even though their physical bodies, exhausted, wore out, they are dead, but yet they continue to live. Look at verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them. 
out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now, behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Man, here we see that God repeats that he has seen their mistreatment. He has seen their abuse. He has seen their oppression. And not only has he seen that, but he has heard their cries. I know what's going on. I know you probably think that I have been dormant and that I've been asleep and that I have missed everything that's gone on over these past 400 years. But I want you to know, I see and I hear. I know what's going on. And let me just encourage you this morning. You might think that God is distant to you this morning. You might think that he is not hearing. You might think, you might even start questioning, God, are you, are you even real because of everything that's going on in your life? And you might be struggling in your faith. And you might be doubting here this morning. But know this, God sees, he knows, and he hears what's going on in your life. And here's the even greater truth. He cares. He cares. Because he cared for his people here and he cares for his people today. And we see there in verse 8 where it says that he said, I have come down to deliver them. What a beautiful and glorious truth. I have come down to deliver them. Now, he came down in the form of a burning bush here in the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, we're going to see that he came down literally, physically, in the person of Jesus Christ. And so Exodus, we see that when he says, I have come down to deliver, Exodus is intended to be a, a microcosm, if you will, of a greater story. All right, a, gr a greater story that is about to be played out. God deeply cared about Israel in their physical slavery, in their physical bondage, but... This was always meant to point to the greater bondage that we all face and all deal with. And so we are all in bondage to, to the slavery of sin and to death. And just like the Israelites, hey, they were, they were under Pharaoh's cruel judgment and, and his cruel reign, but yet every sinner... As we look at that being played out, the, the bondage to Pharaoh there in Egypt, we see that we as sinners ourselves are enslaved to sin and to the bondage of the, the devil's wicked tyranny here. And so just as the Israelites, could they do anything to rescue themselves? Absolutely not. There's nothing they could do. And the same is true for us. There is absolutely nothing we can do to rescue ourselves from sin's slavery. But our heavenly avenger, oh, he's come to deliver us from slavery to sin and lead us to the promised land to worship him forevermore. He continues in verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I? that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. But he said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you, that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this very mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, What is his name? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. I mean, I'm, I'm sure Moses was, was thrilled by verses 7 through 9. Okay, I'm sure there was a rejoicing in his heart in those verses. But now, God, God tells him, Moses, I'm going to use you. 
I'm going to use you to be the savior, to be the deliverer of my people out of Egypt. And so basically God's looking at him and he's like, okay, here, here it goes, Moses. All right, Operation Mission Impossible is now underway. Okay, it, it's, it's cranking up. Because, I mean, Moses understands how impossible the situation is, right? I mean, he knows, hey, last time I was in Egypt, things didn't end very well. Okay? People knew that I murdered, murdered an Egyptian. All right, word got out. Pharaoh wanted me dead. All right, people were questioning me. I mean, of all people, why me? All right, I mean, a pretty good question, all right, for, for Moses to ask. I mean, it's, it's not illegitimate in what he's asking. But yet, we see here a great paradox in Scripture. What is, what is the, the paradox? It's that God uses sinful people to carry out his saving purposes. What an amazing thought that God would use sinful, wicked people, rebellious people to him, that he would use us to carry out his salvif salvific purposes. And so here we'll see that, God, that Moses makes five excuses to God. I mean, five reasons why, man, I, I shouldn't be the one being used here. But, but with each excuse, what does God do? We're going to see that God answers every excuse with statements of his own sovereignty and his own power. And so what, what's he saying? Basically, what, what we've heard before, that who God calls, he equips, right? Whoever God calls, he equips. Whatever he's calling you to do in life, all right, he's going to equip you to serve him and to glorify him. And then he asked the question, as, as, we, as we said, who am I? God, who am I to lead these people? And so Moses now was a shepherd. We know that the Egyptians detested shepherds. I mean, you know, me standing before Pharaoh and, you know, saying I'm a shepherd now and, and they're just going to laugh at me and mock at me and who am I to do that? I mean, he, he had this bad reputation, like we said. Now he's supposed to go to this ruler and, and beg for the people to, 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 to go out and to worship God. I mean, it, it's kind of laughable. And that's what Moses is thinking. But God had been shaping and preparing Moses for this task. But the, it, here, here's, here's what's important. The real issue is not about who Moses was, but it's about who God is. And the same is true for us. It's not about who we are. It's all about who God is. All right? It's not about your circumstances, but it's about who God is. All right? we, need to, we need to remind ourselves of that every day. It, it, as we start doubting and questioning and, and start you know, thinking that God doesn't care, or, you know, He can't work in this situation or, or through me, we need to be reminded it is not about us. It is all about Him. And what did God tell Moses? Moses, I get your question. But here's, here's what I want to leave you with. I will be with you. I will be with you. And so Moses needed to look upward and not inward. Moses was looking at himself. He was looking at his own strength, his own abilities, his own background, his own history. And he was, he was, he was caught here in the inward parts instead of looking upward at God and what he could do. And so the exodus was not dependent upon the ability of Moses, right? It wasn't dependent upon him, but it was regardless of Moses, the exodus would come. And so it's always been about the power of God. And so God, again, God doesn't need your ability to serve him. He just wants your availability to submit to him, okay? He doesn't need your powers, your abilities in any way. In fact, despite those or the lack of those, God will work through you. Matthew 28, 20 reminds us, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the earth. God is with us. He will guide us. Philippians 2 reminds us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. It is not about us. It's not about our abilities. Even if you think that you have something to offer to God, you don't. Okay? Even if you're incredibly smart, 
Even if you're incredibly powerful, you're incredibly fit physically, uh, all right, you've got all types of gifts and abilities and all, God doesn't care. And God will use you despite what you think you have to offer him. But he wants to bring us to a place of humility, of teachability, and realizing that it's through him and him alone that we can be used. And so here's, here's the sign that God gave him. All right, Here's the sign, Moses, that, that I will give you, that I will bring the children out of Israel. What was the sign? He said, you'll worship me on this mountain. This mountain that I'm meeting you on, you will return here, and the people of Israel as a nation will worship me here. Now, I don't know about you, that seems a little strange as a sign, right? I mean, when we think sign, okay, God, I want you to do one of the miracles that you, know, you can do. That's a sign. But what's the sign that he gave? It's something that would happen in the future. So what's that mean? It means that Moses was going to have to walk by faith and not by sight. The sign I'm going to give you, Moses, really isn't a sign right now. But one of these days, you will return to this mountain with the people of Israel. And it's at that moment, you're going to realize God is exactly who he said he was. He is going to do the unexplainable. And so Moses went on, he asked, God, who are you? Okay, who, who, who are you? All right, I'm going to go back to the Israelites and I'm going to tell them, all right, the God of your fathers, you know, he, he sent me here to, to lead you all out of slavery. And they're going to want to know what's your name and how the answer. He says, I am who I am. What in the world does that even mean, right? I'm pr we're probably more confused that he said that than if he hadn't said it, right? I am who I am. What does, what does that even mean? It, ju it just means he is essentially saying here that he is eternal, that he is unchangeable, that he is self-sufficient, that he is self-existent, and that he is infinitely perfect. All right? And so much more. Okay? That's a, that's a brief summation of what God means when he says, I am who I am. I will be who I need to be at any given moment. All right? I am, I am so transcendent. I am so otherworldly. I am so outside of your understanding of, of who God is. That's who I am. All right? Let your mind just go and wander. I am far past that. And so he is trying to encourage Moses and the, and the people here. And so uh, now we could spend a lot of time trying to figure out exactly what this name means. Okay, we could go into all the studies that, you know, commentators and theologians have done trying to study what that name means. He, he says in verse 15, he says, uh, God said to Moses, say to this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers. All right, uh, the word Lord there is is the word we understand is Yahweh, all right, the covenant-keeping name of God. But why don't we just jump ahead to the New Testament for clarity, okay? Let's let, let's let Jesus himself clarify this for us in John 8, 58. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Open and shut. We now know who the I am is. It's Jesus. It is the Godhead, the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We understand who he was. And so Jesus was claiming to be the God of Moses. Right? That's who he's saying. I am the God of Moses. And so the religious leaders... They understood what Jesus was saying. I mean, have you ever heard people say, well, Jesus never said that he was God. He never claimed to be God, right? I mean, just how ignorant. I mean, I, just, I don't know what else to say, all right? That's just utterly ignorant. Because the religious leaders in, their, in that day, they knew exactly what Jesus meant. How do we know that? Because what was their reaction? They wanted to stone him, right? They were saying, blasphemy. This is one who is claiming to be God. God, and he must be stoned. And so Jesus 
made it very clear who he was. And so a genuine Christian, get this, a genuine Christian is someone who believes that Jesus is the great I am. As followers of Christ, we understand this is Christ pictured here in the Old Testament. And then he continues on in verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say to them, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, has appeared to me, saying, I have observed you and what, is, what has been done to you in Egypt. And I promise that I will bring up out of the affliction of Egypt to the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Be- per- uh, Jebusites, a land flowing with milk and honey. He is stressing this land is occupied. That is a lot of people that are occupying the land right now. Talk about faith. How, how are we going to get rid of them and occupy this for ourselves? Verse 18, and they will listen to your voice, the elders. And you, will, and, you and the elders of Israel shall go to the king of, of Egypt and say to him, The Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. And now please let us go a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. But I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. So God's laying it out for him. Verse 21, And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and when you go, you should not go empty. But get this, but each woman shall ask her neighbor, her Egyptian neighbor, and any woman who lives in her house for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. You shall put them on your sons and on your daughters, so you shall plunder the Egyptians. So here we see God graciously moved the elders of Israel to believe Moses. All right? So we see the hand of God at work to where the elders of Israel hear Moses and they believe him. And they're with him. And so as one voice all right, they are, they are going to, to Pharaoh saying, hey, go on our behalf. And Moses goes before Pharaoh and he's basically asking them, hey, we want a three-day trip to go worship our God. We, we're just wanting a weekend retreat to go worship our God. All right, now, I don't know why three days. I mean, why not four or five or whatever? It really doesn't matter. What's the issue? The real issue here is one of worship. That, that's the issue, is that... Pharaoh will not allow the people of Israel out of his sight to go worship. Why? Because he's afraid they're going to run, right? I mean, that's, that's ultimately why he's not letting them go. And so God warned Moses that, hey, initially, Pharaoh's not going to let you go. All right? I'm, I'm going to warn you up front. Do not be surprised when he doesn't let you go. And so this refusal here clearly demonstrates what? The hardening of the heart of Pharaoh, Right? I mean, let's be honest. He had no, no fear of the true God. I mean, they worshiped multiple gods. In fact, he claimed to be a God. All right? And so he had no fear of the true God. And so it was basically when Pharaoh was saying, no, you cannot go, it was like him saying, okay, God of Israel, bring it on. How dare you? I am God. I have power over these people. I am the one holding them in slavery. Where have you been for 400 years? Bring it on. You, th- you think you worship some God out there? <laughs> Cry out to him. Go ahead, but you're going to do it here. Under my thumb. Under my rule. And so we see here that that would ultimately come back to bite him, right? But yet we see in verse 22, notice how God blesses. He blesses the Israelite women and their families with what? With a shopping spree. Okay? How awesome is that, ladies? All right? He, he blesses them with a shopping spree. They go to the Egyptians and they ask them for their silver and their gold. All right? Ask them. And, and what happens? They give it to them. They give it to them. And so uh, that, that's still to come. But again, we're, we're going to see that all played out in the coming chapters here. 
And so God made sure, man, he made sure that all of the work, all the labor that the Israelites had done, man, they're going to get paid for it, all right? They're going to get paid for it. You're going to plunder the Egyptians. And so basically, in all of the description that God gave to Moses, he lays out everything that's going to happen for him, basically. God's basically calling this shot, right? All right? Off the backboard, you know, off the over here. You know, it's kind of like that Michael Jordan commercial, you know. It's kind of off the, the, the bleachers and, and so on. God's calling the shot. He's telling Moses, this is exactly how it's going to play out. It's going to happen. I'm going to make the shot, okay? And that's what plays out. And so Genesis 15, uh, verses 13 and 14. We are reminded again of that covenant when he said, then the Lord said to Abram, now again, this is written uh, and talked about before it actually happened. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted, how long? For 400 years, but I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with what? Great possessions. They will be plundered. God had told Abraham, this is what's going to happen to your descendants. And what do we see played out 400 years later? All of this exactly how God had said. And so ironically, all of those metals that they would accumulate would eventually be used in the building of the tabernacle. And all that was laid out in it. And so when Christ liberates his people, he lavishes his gifts upon them, right? And the same is true for us. When he brings us out of bondage, out of slavery, he lavishes the gifts of his Holy Spirit upon us. And so what do we take away from this real quick? Number one, God is passionate about rescuing enslaved people. Boy, there is no question about that. God is passionate about rescuing enslaved people. God wants us to live in the freedom that Christ gives without fear of condemnation. He doesn't want us to fear that the enemy is going to come back in and steal us and rob us of our salvation. Just like the Israelites didn't have to worry that the, the Egyptians were going to come back and rob them of their freedom. God destroyed them. And understand this, on the cross, Christ destroyed our enemy. We do not have to worry about being overthrown and being brought into slavery anymore. He has come to deliver us, to give us power and victory over temptation and sin's desires. Number two, God's purpose for our release from slavery to sin is worship. The whole purpose that God has saved you, that he has forgiven you of your sins, is that you would worship him. That you would bring glory to his name day in and day out. Parents, let me just ask you. Man, are you, are you leading your children to worship God faithfully? I mean, are, are you spending time talking about the things of God? Uh, I, I encourage you. Uh, make it, make it a, a goal every, every day, every night. As your children, I know, I know for Dustin and Danielle, when they were growing up, uh, we would kind of get them ready for bed, give them their baths, and get ready in their pajamas and everything. We would go into uh, the bedroom. We were usually in Dustin's bedroom, sitting on the bed together, and we would read uh, God's Word. Now, a lot of times it's uh, little devotional books, you know, for children's, like the Jesus Storybook Bible or something similar to that. We would read through that together. We would, we would talk about it briefly. Uh, as they were growing older, we would kind of ask them about their day, what's going on, you know, and, and try to engage with what God's truth, how that applies into their life, even as children. It, it, man, in today's culture, there's multiple opportunities to apply that. But, but taking that opportunity to worship with them and to raise up a, an understanding of the holiness of God, that he is otherworldly, that he is just transcendent, that he is all-powerful, but he's all-knowing. He knows them intimately. And so guide them and help them from early on. Help them to process their life through God's truth. And so everything that we do ultimately 
is an act of worship to God. Don't, don't think that as you're going to work, oh, that's not worship. It is. Don't think that as you're going to the grocery store, it's not worship. It is. Everything that you do, every breath that you take is an act of worship. You are either worshiping God or you're worshiping yourself. It's one of the two. And so the last thing we see is that God is our God in life and in death. What did Jesus say to the Pharisee or, the, or to the Sadducees? He is not the God of the dead, but he's God of the living. God desires to work supernaturally through our, our lives as we battle sin now, in the here and now. But God, God desires to work su- supernaturally to bring us ultimate victory when death comes. He is our God in life and in in death. He is the great I am. Not the great I was, but the great I am. Praise be to his name. What a glorious picture he has painted here for us in chapter 3. And as we move forward, he is only going to reveal himself all the more. So God, as we come to you right now, Father, what is our hope in both life and death? It is Christ alone. He is our only confidence because our souls belong to him. May this glorious truth cause our hearts to rejoice in the great I am, not the great I was. When fears try to rise up within us, when when those stormy trials seek to, to overwhelm us, when when waves like a a tsunami, like what happened recently, hover over us, may we run to the rock of Christ. May we encourage one another, God, regularly, that our hope, it is rooted in the God who has proven himself trustworthy and has proven himself powerful enough to not only create everything from nothing, but to also bring life from death. All the way to the grave, may we sing, Christ, he lives, he lives. In his precious name we pray, amen. Amen. Let's stand together as we consider these words. Let us do just that and worship the great I am. worship and consider the great hope that we have in him. This altar is open to come and pray. Consider his good words. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone, Christ alone. Redeemer's blood Who holds our faith 
When fears arise, who stands above the stormy trial? Who sends the waves that bring us nigh unto the shore, the rock of Christ? Oh, sing, hallelujah, our hope. Springs eternal, oh, sing hallelujah. Now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Unto the grave, what will Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives, and what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him, there we will rise to meet the Lord, then sin and death will be destroyed. With endless joy, when Christ is ours forevermore. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess Christ our hope in life and death. Oh, sing hallelujah, our hope springs eternal. Oh, sing hallelujah, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death, now and ever we confess. Christ, our hope in life and death. I'm going to ask you to be seated just for a quick second here. I uh, do want to make you uh, mindful that tonight we will be uh, continuing our Transform uh, classes that we have. And uh, those start at 6 o'clock. Uh, we've got three different classes for you to choose from, so I'd uh, love for you to come back and be a part of those. They are going to be a rich blessing for you. Also, uh, tomorrow night, Moms in Prayer meet, and so ladies, encourage you to come out, enjoy some time in prayer and fellowship together, praying for our, our children, uh, for the schools, just those uh, administrators and all in charge. Obviously, these are days, crucial days, a lot going on. Uh, within our, our schools. And so we just want to pray encouragement for Christian teachers, uh, for uh, students who are followers of Christ, as, uh, as, hey, darkness is out there, but yet may they shine the light of the gospel brightly uh, in our school systems. Uh, also, our baby bottle campaign continues on. Please make sure, if you haven't grabbed one, uh, I think we might have some more. If not, just put it in any container you want. Bring that in with you as we support the Blue Ridge uh, Women's Center. Uh, Wednesday night, I will be uh, continuing in our, uh, our Wednesday night sermon-based discussion. So we will talk further, go deeper into Exodus chapter 3. And uh, what a great opportunity for it to just kind of be solidified in your heart and mind as you are really trying to just grow in Christ, trying to grow in his word, I encourage you to come. Uh, we just have a great time with that. And uh, I think, uh, is that most everything? Okay. Uh, I do want to uh, just uh, bring uh, before you uh, Lily uh, Bishop. I think she's here. There she is. Yeah. Uh, couldn't find you there. But uh, Lily is coming this morning. Uh, Lily is coming to, uh, to be presented to you for full membership. Uh, Lily uh, just, uh, well, it's been a little while now with COVID, but uh, turned 18 she uh, went through our Getting to Know Green Ridge class, and, uh, and so we as pastors are excited about bringing her. Uh, just again, in case you didn't know, 
uh, when you're younger than 18, you're a member, but yet it's kind of restricted in that you can't vote yet when we vote and, uh, and serve on key committees. But now in adulthood, those things, uh, those privileges start opening up. And so we're excited. It's been a joy uh, just watching Lily grow into a young woman of God and now in college and serving the Lord there. So, uh, so your pastors are bringing her, her to you uh, as, uh, as a full member and we want you to affirm her in that. And if you affirm her, say praise the Lord. Praise Amen. Lord. Praise God. We're excited about what God's doing in your life and looking forward to her continuing to grow in Christ. And we want to do all we can to continue to pour into your life and looking forward to you pouring into us in return. Amen. All right. Well, uh, I'm going to ask you to stand. And uh, as we close out, we're going to be closing out in song again. Come back tonight. Hope that you'll be blessed uh, in those classes that we have. Let's close. Let's end our time just considering, beholding this great God. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. Behold our God. Behold our God. Seated on his throne. Come let us adore him. Behold our King. Nothing can compare. Come let us adore Go in peace, worshiping the great I Am.